Greetings, everyone. So uh, my name is Matt Curcio, and I'm located in Massachusetts. I'm currently on Cape Cod, um, where the weather is really, really nice. So um, if I start looking out the window and, and uh, uh, diverting my attention, it's because it's really beautiful out there. So I hope you guys are having beautiful weather too. But um, let's start with the uh, basic UI. So this third chapter was the basic UI, and, and it seems fairly simple. It's just an introduction to a lot of the commands, basically. Uh, we'll kind of go over some and some of the notes, and, and I have a short, um, short, took, uh, took a short, um, app and basically put all the commands in there and uh, you can play, play with those later on if you'd like. Um, but uh, here we go. So um, the Shiny inter interface is three sections, the inputs, outputs, and the layouts. I always like to put a little FI FYI uh, on my slides to sort of let people know that there's things out there and places they can go. Is this all visible to everyone? Can I just get a check-in from people if they would just un unmute their mics? And... It's perfectly visible. Uh, Very good. Visible. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically, the user interface is fairly simple in our discussion today. So as you learned from the previous discussion, the user interface is, or the basic Shiny application is two sections. So it is the user interface and the server, and that's basically it. Uh, we have one constraint or one set of constraints for the ID, and that's the ID that you might find for your um, variables that you're inputting or taking in or um, files that you're sort of loading in. And uh, those, those constraints are simply, the names have to be letters, numbers, and underscores. So no slashes, dashes, and special characters. Obviously, they have to be unique as well. So what can you input? What can we take in from this shiny, into this shiny package? Well, we can take in text, numeric variables, dates, uh, limited choices. I also call them multiple choices. Um, I don't know if that's an Australian term, but uh, we also have file uploads and action buttons or just buttons. So the general command form is much like any other R command. So you have your command, then your variables. Uh, here you may have the ID and the label are the most common that you'd have for most every one of them. Um, if you're using the RStudio interface, IDE, don't forget you can use your tab completion and F1 to get help. And then depending on the command that you're using, you might have some additional variables. So those additional variables might help you with a slider, for example, or with showing your image in the right format and the right size. Um, it may even have columns that you're sort of looking for and, and uh, rows and so forth. You can even resize your image to fill or contract a span, just like you would with a um, HTML command or a CSS commands. So um, that's not surprising because basically we are generating HTML and we can use CSS. So looking at the simplest set of commands, we have the text and numerical commands. Now every output is coupled with a render. So the output might be a text. If you're inputting a text and you're going to output it later on, you're going to have to render that in the server. But for the meantime, we have some simple ones and I will also bring this up here. So all I did was basically steal the commands from the book and place them into this. And, and you know, we've got these set of commands. So in this one, um, this one here, um, you have a placeholder. Um, actually, I've changed it to first name, but uh, you can put placeholders in these things. Um, you can uh, actually, with the text area input, you actually have a 
handle on the bottom right hand side. Um, here is where you can put in the number of rows and so forth. Numerics, same sort of way. Uh, if you set a range, you might have, uh, I believe I set a range of 100 to this. Um, you can only put in that variable if you put in 101 and then put there. It won't accept it, but it will just go up and down to that. We also have dates, multiple choices, file uploads, and action buttons. So dates are fairly straightforward. A single date might be your birth date. Um, you can actually set mins and maxes to these, which is kind of interesting. So, um, you know, if I want to uh, have a certain date range that I'm looking for, I can only allow, let's say, January 1st to, you know, July 1st. Um, you also have ranges, date ranges, and here again you can set mins and maxes. Limited choice. The limited choice they showed was fairly simple. Um, so you have some radio buttons, basically, is the first one. And um, the animals that they gave as the options were actually put above the user interface in the general program. So you might find um, something such as, such as this. So you might open your program with the library Shiny, and then you might have your choices for the fluid page. And here I have animal choices, cats, dogs, porpoise, states, so forth, so on. And those are above my interface, and then I can call them later on. Uh, let's see. Um, pull down menus, drop down menus are fairly simple. Again, you have the list of choices that you might have, and you can actually choose one, or with other drop downs, you can choose multiples. So here it asks you for one state, here you can flip a switch, namely the multiple switch, which is. Um, Let's see, I don't know if I actually flipped this. Oh, here it is, multiple switch. So you might say true in that circumstance. And we can then choose non sequitur and AK and, uh, oops, this one is RI and MA and non sequitur. So fairly, fairly simple. The next set, you have uh, click boxes, check boxes. Um, I don't know if that's shown here, but um, if we go to our, our um, commands, we have a check input box. We will call it a name, and then we might have a, a label. And a nice thing about the checkbox is you can actually say what the default value would be. So by checking false, for example, it would show my checkbox as defaulting to, to false, or otherwise I can check true, um, or I can change that to true, and uh, then change that to a checked box instead. Buttons. Buttons are fairly common. Um, it's possible to change your buttons with uh, CSS, and that's something that we'll probably talk about later on. But it's fairly simple to just call a simple button, and uh, we can use that. OK, so moving on in a sense, once we have our inputs, and once we have the information we've taken in, we can save those in variable names and store them for later to be processed. How do you output them? Well, the outputs have to be coupled with some sort of text output, or if it's a print, it has to be it has to be coupled with some sort of verbatim text output, or even with tables. I'm going to jump around a little bit. You might have Table output going to render tables. Data tables going to render data tables. So let's look at the simplest one. 
So we have simple text. If we look at here, we have goodbye world instead of hello world, and we simply say text output and text output text is our variable, and then we're rendering that value. Uh, we can also do calculations. So one thing that's kind of nice is if you want to check some simple calculations, you can you can line it up. Let's see if I got that. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Just misplaced it. Anyway, um, so we'll continue on with that. Um, so doing tables, obviously you can have dynamic tables or uh, static tables. Um, the dynamic tables are pretty interesting. You can actually change quite a bit. Um, so I can actually view quite a lot of data or even search the data. So if I want a Virginica, um, I may use something like that. I can show the entire list if I want, but let's just go to 10. And you can now change the max and mins that way, or the sorting as it is, and looking at all the different pages. So that's quite nice. Um, whereas a head would simply just give you a number of lines. Now, uh, quickly continuing through, we have tables and plots and uh, other things. Here again, I've showed a, a better sort of indication. Well, here again, I've showed the user interface and the server. So if I wanted a table, I might call it in the user interface, a data frame that's static or a data frame that's dynamic. And then I have to render it in the server. So it's a two-pronged approach where you have to sort of call it in your user interface, what you're going to put in front of the user, and then as a server is, it's sort of presenting that to the uh, um, to the viewer. Excuse me, may I ask a question, please? Sure. Yeah, can you please um, go to the previous slide, please? Yeah, so um, here, um, where we have in the UI fluid page, we have the text output and we have hello friend. Mm -hmm. And when we come down to the server side, we have output text, render text animal. So um, I was expecting uh, whatever we, um, where do we get this text at text? Output ah, so one thing that I didn't do with this example, I stole it straight from the book, was I didn't actually add in the variable names and um, basically this is just a static variable that's going in there. So if I wanted to, I would have to go into something like this uh, where I might have, ah, okay, um, text, text, text. Here we go. So in this circumstance, I might have the story being the variable. My uh, label is simply what's on top, what's on top of this. And then if I wanted to call that story later on, I would have to go to since I'm using a text, um, I would have to, a text output, I'd have to go to text render, and then I would put that text render in the server section and with the variable name. So I would do something like this, output text, and then story in here, I believe. Oops. I believe that's correct. So that would actually allow me to print out that text named variable. You'd have to do input dollar sign story. Otherwise, it's not going to make it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. So input dollar sign story here? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Dollar sign story. There we go. Um, so does that answer your question? No. No. <laughs> OK. Yeah. What, uh, so, what seems to be the misunderstanding? Yeah, yeah. so my misunderstanding, if, if we look at the book at uh, section 3.31, maybe I mean, I'm misunderstanding it right. So uh, 
3.31, the test output we have uh, text. Yeah, 3.31. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So here we have uh, text output. We have text inside the column, and we here we have verbatim text output. We have code inside the column. So when we come here in the server, uh, for us to call output, we put output dollar text and output dollar code. But that is not the same. Um, in That's a good question. Actually, I had a question about that. Maybe there's someone else who understood it better than me. So this kind of puzzled me to have a a variable name code, and then you're outputting that code, and you're basically just telling the code how to render your your static variable, basically. So um, yeah. So is um, that my understanding is um, in the UI here, we say text output, then we open bracket, we say text, and we say verbatim text, um, text output, we say code. So whenever we want to call this variable, um, if you look at the second, um, the server side down here, so for us to refer to this um, variable, the output, we say text output text or output code which are the name of that we specify in our UI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to get, yes. to get the, the information back into the UI, you have to specify it as output dollar sign. If it isn't, if it isn't specified as output, um, you're not going to be able to pick it back up in your, in your UI section. Mm, okay. So in this case, your output, uh, your output text, um, this is specifying that it is available as an output thing. And so since you're then referencing text output, that's implying that it is picking up the text variable from the output which has been created in the server. Much so in this circumstance where I'm looking at the right-hand side, if I got let's say this one, this line in my user interface, I might change it to text here as well. Is that correct? No. No? So, so the thing is, is if you had input text, you would need a, you'd need a variable or you'd need a, oh, whatchamacallit, a, a, a thing where you can input stuff. You would need an input thing. An input box? A variable name of text. And I found that naming both your input and your output the same thing ends up, and it doesn't Very always confusing. kind of cross wires, but yes. it, you're more likely to cross wires than not. I see. So um, if I take this just a bit further, um, I may have something like, uh, let's just input id and then i might have um the label yes. uh, um yes. tell me oops uh, tell me your name yeah uh, and that would actually be um more appropriate for this circumstance is that correct yeah um, but, yeah, but you but would need an input, text input. Yeah, you yeah text. so the only way that you can get data into an input to reference in on the server side is to put it through a text input. The only way that you can get data out of the server side back into the UI right, is right. to use a text output. Unless we're getting into render UIs, but that's in a later chapter. So gotcha. ignore that for the moment. Gotcha. All right. That's um, good Thank to know. I, I'm still new to this myself, so it's a learning experience for everyone. Um, let's continue on. So um, we were at the tables. Um, output for plots. Um, now, the plots seem fairly straightforward. So basically, 
all you're doing is is outputting a plot named negative slope plot and you're asking to render that plot and, and you're basically saying you know i have a plot of certain size and certain dimensions and then you're going to your well this is the server section uh, here it is i'm sorry in your user section you plot output the name of your plot and then you describe the plot and what's going to be served to the client is your output negative slope plot, which is your name, and then rendering that plot. Yes. So, uh, are there any questions on that? Okay. Um, I found playing around with some of these that as you put in a lot more variables, and even if you have multiple panels or, or grids, this can get very confusing very easily. And I was sort of wondering um, if anyone has any ideas on how they simplify this. Um, and maybe that's for another topic in the future, but um, does anyone have any ideas on that? Does anyone have uh, some advanced knowledge of, of uh, putting tables and grids together with Shiny? No, I mean, there's there's a variety of different options. I usually end up using a nav bar page uh, um, with with sidebars, simply mm. because then I can more easily specify exactly where things are going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anyone else has really ever tried to deal with the fluid rows in the columns, but I've never quite gotten them to ever line up the way that I really wanted them to. Mm. Um, you know, I always kind of figured, okay, I specify a fluid row, and so I can just put all of these things right next to each other, and mm -hmm. it never quite comes off the way that I expect it to. Is it is it a grid twelve, or how does that work? Do you? I think it's supposed to be grid twelve, and so if you wanted three across, you do column four. For yeah, all, yeah. For all three of them. Right. Um, right. And then you can place then, them, place one input and the second input. In, yeah, okay. I'll have to play with that and find out. Um, yeah, because that got really confusing after a while. Basically, um, you know, I, I started labeling my parentheses, and uh, I think there is a command or there's a a set of tools for colored parentheses, and I didn't load that in this time, so. Um, it might be helpful for others when they're doing that to load in the colored parentheses and colored um, colored inputs and outputs. So uh, continuing on, very, very simply, um, the outputs just briefly talk about what's possible in the future and um, Bootstrap and the Grid 12 and tab sets and themes are even possible. Um, that seems like that might be more more work in the future. Um, a very, very simple, if I can do an aside, a very simple sidebar and main panel can be found with a shiny web app called from the button here, a new shiny web app, and we'll call it test. And basically it gives you a simple, simple slider with a histogram. And I can run that. And I was using that to sort of play around with things as well. Oops. Let's do let's do this. Where was that? Run. Here we go. So here it places the side panel and you have the main panel. So already you're, you're getting into several layers deep, basically. Um, and that seemed like it could get very confusing very quickly. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out here is, you know, I haven't necessarily shown people how to connect the dots here. You're simply just inputting values, inputting numbers, text, or dates. Um, 
doing work with them, I think, is shown later on, basically. And just sort of presenting and printing out is what they mainly talk about in this chapter. There's a lot more things, like the downloads, they talk about chapter nine. Um, and the different layouts is much later on, too. So um, under the hood, it seems as if you can use HTML and CSS to get your jobs and get your job done. And basically, you can use your standard HTML formats and variables and classes and names and so forth. Um, another thing that I kind of liked was I ran across uh, some more information. I'll show that. Is that here? I don't know. Um, I ran across some other websites. So uh, Nanshu actually has a website um, that uh, doesn't seem to come up right now, but there's other packages that may help one do these sort of boxes and um, uh, different functions, which might be a little handier. And they talk about those, I guess we'll get to those in the case study. Um, there's also a couple books that I found that were sort of suggested at the bottom of the chapter, but um, there was a couple others that I found just sort of doodling around. And one is um, Engineering Production, uh, which is an entire book online. And the other one was Understanding User Interfaces with Shiny. And uh, those are all online books. So those are helpful as well as this book here. Um, the summary, we have the three components of the user interface. Inputs, you're inputting, and if you want to render, it's render text, goes to the output. Uh, verbatim text output is, gone to, is going to the render print, and the same thing happens with tables and other, uh, other commands as well. So a very, very quick introduction. Um, I just want to give you an overview of what will be coming, what we'll be seeing in the future. And um, I think it's um, something to play with for now. And that's basically it. If you have any questions um, or other things, just give me a contact at um, my email, which is listed here. Uh, just delete the spaces. And uh, I'm happy to chat and uh, converse with people. So with that, I thank you. Uh, great, thanks, thanks, Matt, for, um, for for the talk. Does does anyone have any um, specific questions about Matt uh, that follow on directly from Matt's talk? Um, feel free to unmute yourself. And... Okay, so mentioned in the chat. No. Um... I tried some of the exercises. Did many people try some of the exercises? Can I get a an hallelujah from anyone who tried them? No hallelujahs? Okay. Um, some were interesting. Um, you know, the they're very basic ones, but, um, you know, you really have to dig into the documentation to find some of the answers. And... Um, you know, you find some of the problems with the documentation, obviously, um, as you read through it. But, um, you know, it just takes a little sifting through those. Um, did you want to go through some of those exercises, uh, Russ? Or did you uh, just let people oh, yeah, 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 ask definitely. questions? Um, yeah, um, if, if, if we've got time, if you've got time to go through them. Yeah, right. sure, sure. Um, let me pull up the... Um, uh, chapter of the book again, and um, so um, inputs. So we might have something such as exercises. Um, okay, so the first one is fairly simple. Uh, you have a input box for your. Is Darth Vader here? You might have an input box, and uh, you can use placeholders, as I've sort of shown here, to sort of tell people, uh, very, very much like HTML, tell people um, what you want in that box. 
um, here, the slider input, um, I gave that a try on another spreadsheet, and uh, I think that's on another computer. But um, there are ways to do things with um, uh, lubridate, and that's actually one of the commands that you might use when you're using um, sliders with dates. Lubridate, and then you're sort of calling in the different dates that way. Um, let's see. Numeric, use the following numeric. So um, let's see. If you have a moderately long list, well, let's try number three. Um, it's useful to create subheadings that break the list up into pieces. Uh, read the documentation for select input to find out. Uh, the underlying HTML is opt group. So as you can see, there's a lot more reading and sort of self-study that needs to be done um, from there. Um, I did not get through the entire set of exercises, both for the inputs and outputs, but um, it's quite a bit of uh, digging and, and extra work. Um, another thing that I tried was some of the simplest ones for, let's say, the outputs, um, changing width and height, which is fairly similar to our plots anyway. And uh, that's simply putting those in as um, extra variables, basically. Um, I think that's pretty standard. Um, it gave a couple other examples um, that I'd like to try later on. If anyone would like to try these and communicate with me as I go through them this week, um, that would be great. I'd love to see what you have. And, uh, you know, sort of as I work on them, we can sort of share bits and pieces. Um, so I am on Slack sometimes and um, emails the best also. I don't know if people use Google Meet, but I find that very, very easy as well. Anything else? What were you saying about Lubridate and the slider input for the date? So um, when I looked at the second exercise for this, I found a reference in Stack Overflow. This person seemed to be going through the book just like I was basically, and they asked a very similar question. And basically what they said is they called up Lubridate to deal with the dates, and then they formatted using the time format, which is in um, this slider input. So if we go to, let's say, slider input, slider input. If you go down and look for the different subcommands or different labels that you might use, you can see a time format down here. And this is what you're going to sort of use to sort of communicate with Lubridate. You can put in your, your month and year, for example, and you can start scrolling by month and year or by date, day, month, and year. Um, and that's one of the things that I found on Stack Overflow. Let me see if I can just pull that up quickly. Um, I mean, if you wanted to also scroll by month and year, you should be able to tell it to go by you should be able to change the the step so i don't know whether step would let you do it by month yeah um the person answering that question said there was a kink in that thinking or in that the way they were using it the step didn't actually work for um, the month they were trying to get. So it's something to play with. Now there's quite a lot of areas to really sort of play around with here. And um, there's a lot of variables that one can pull up, I guess, for all the commands. Um, for example, the animation options, uh, I didn't even get the chance to look at those. And that's um, another thing that you can 
use as well. So um, there's also a double sided um, slider input for dates where you can actually decide yes. both your, your both sides of it. That one's quite a bit more complex to program in. Uh -huh. um, but it can be useful. And in that context, that's where the the range, I think, what it, I don't know, it's the range value. Uh, yeah, the drag range is is useful because you can set it at like 90 days and it will move along as you drag it. Oh, really? Okay. So one of the examples they showed in the book was a, a double-headed range as well. Is that what you're discussing? Sort of, you know, a, a min and max that you're sort of searching for? And in this circumstance, you have, let's say... Pop this out and try to run this. Yeah, I can't remember which one it is exactly, but um, but you can basically have it pop up a uh, a slider input, and you can you can move either side of the slider usually, but I think you can also lock the range. So, like if you drag the the range to to a future time period, it's still going to stick at ninety days. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, um, I just have a sort of scare in here. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more, and I think it, this book is going to require a lot more self-study and reading. Um, just going through the written sections barely scratch the surface of what you can do and what even answering the exercises, I found that was quite a... Um, not enough information to sort of uh, answer a lot of those things. So there's a lot more documentation reading that's going to be, have to be done by people uh, if they're going to stay with this course, I guess. I just wanted to point that out. Um, but it's possible, and uh, I think it'll be fun. So um, how many people here have used um, Shiny before? Are there a lot of people here that have used Shiny or just a few? Any messages, any? Russ, have you used it before? Me, I, I never actually used Shiny before starting reading the book, but I have um, written a couple of apps uh, inspired by reading the first couple of chapters, but, but really I'm yeah. at a very early stage in learning. Okay, uh, so we're all newbies here. That's interesting. I, yeah. I, I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. what I, one thing I was thinking of doing with regards to the book club was maybe getting in someone much more experienced to do a kind of talk one week. Because you know, the, the book's split up into four large sections, and I was wondering yes. if it might be useful to get someone in who's a, <laughs> not uh, quite such a beginner as. Well, no, I think that's a great idea. I think, you know. It, it's nice to sort of have people to bounce ideas off of, um, you know, rather than sort of stumbling around in the dark, if, you know, if that's possible. Um, let me check around too and see if there's someone that might be able to help us out and sit in and kind of answer a few questions here and there. But if anyone knows of people that are um, interested in going over and maybe teaching bits and pieces of Shiny, um, I'd like to hear some of that. I'd like to see some of that in the future. Hey, this is Scott. I would just comment that um, there are quite a few folks within the R4DS Slack community who do have experience with, with Shiny. They may not come to this, you know, book club meeting, but they're certainly more than willing to answer questions on the Great. channels focused to, Excellent. Focused to Shiny. And I, I, I would say I was a, a beginner about a year ago, and then over the summer very quickly got some experience in putting a... Uh, fairly large app with a couple thousand lines of code into production actually really yeah not by myself but with a colleague mm. and um but i have some experience and i'll chime in uh to share where i can if uh if i'm able to make it is that uh, shiny app um available to the public is is it something that we can look at and sort of um go over or is that a um, private 
It's it's an I mean it's it's now being deployed as a software as a service actually on AWS hmm. um, for subscribers. But uh, we do have a demo model that I can probably make available to the community to uh, to play with. Yeah, that might be interesting. That might be good. Yeah, if you can, if you can simplify it. I know that's sometimes tough to sort of pull things out. And... Well, we have we kind of have a free demo as a trial that yeah. gives people enough of an idea of how it works without letting them abuse it with their own data, um, you know, and basically get what we're trying to sell for free. So, yeah. All right. Good. Good. Excellent. Um, is there anything so, else? Any any business? Any uh, things like that? So, Matt, I'll admit, I'm not really a newbie at Shining. Uh, mm -hmm. I've actually used it for work for the last four or five years. Um, and oh. Struggled through it at first. I just wanted to be part of a book club. Um, <laughs> so Yeah, you didn't necessarily speak up when I asked about that, but that's fine. Um, yeah, I apparently accidentally um, direct messaged Morgan rather than the entire group. So Okay. Um, do you think you'll stay with the, the group, the book? Yeah, I mean, you know, going through it, um, you know, uh, when they were talking, I mean, the next chapter is on reactivity, um, and I had never actually used React log before. So that made something quite a bit more interesting. Yeah, Here, yeah. These aren't things that, I mean, we, so we also, I also gone through the hassle of setting up a shiny server on mm. an internal server, um, simply because it's the easiest way to actually share apps uh, with other people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I have a fair bit of time under my belt with Shiny. Oh, good, good. All right. Um... Yeah, that might be interesting to do, just sort of get a AWS instance, a freebie instance going and sort of share things that way as well. Um, you know, that's something to think about. Well, good, good. Thanks, Robert. Um, and also thanks, Scott, too. Um, anyone else? I should state, though, um, the, the, the R for Data Science Slack, the, the community, um, does have... Um, does have capacity on the shinyapps.io uh, website to put our own um, apps up there as kind of examples of, um, it, you know. Oh, really? Suppose, supposing we did a kind of, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a group study type generate an app type thing, uh, we could put it up on the shinyapps.io. Uh, um, Who has yeah. access to that? Who uh, knows? how to enter into that? Um, well, I, w I would need to um, speak with John to get um, God, gotcha. access rights to, to, to push things on there, but um, that wouldn't be a huge issue. Uh, but obviously, were we to put something on there, it would have to be s something that would be publicly viewable and, and things like Amenable that. Amenable to the group, I agree, I agree. But just as a teaching, instance yeah, i think yeah. that would be uh very interesting very fun yeah good I've good been, so i've been a bit quiet but i'm enjoying my hand session this week um not loads of experience but like built a few apps whilst I'm getting into it work for six months or so and i was thinking actually there is an app we built last year where we kind of survived with most of the uh, shiny stuff we had a technical architect who did some back end database bits and um, a front end developer who did some, some HTML and CSS writing. So, what I need to do is basically de strip all like brand data files and a few bits. But I think actually, once I do that, I can probably put that up on the, um, on the Shiny App service and that could be a. That'd, that'd be great. And, and what is your name, by the way? You have a very interesting long name. <laughs> you're, you're speaking to Jerome. He did the presentation last week on. Chapter ah, I see Jerome. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did that last week as well. Change my picture. Gotcha. Are you the one that's in the Virgin Islands or in the Caribbean? Caribbean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I think I've been to. I've seen you talk at um, one of the other groups. Maybe the Biostats group. 
I'm not sure, it might be someone else. I've, um, I think I'm like the other guest groups. Um, uh, I don't think I've done yeah, any talks. I definitely haven't done any talks in the last months. Um, um, could, I, could I just ask a general question of everyone? What's uh, what's their industry? What's their background? I, I have a biological background. Um, is it business? Is it um, marketing? Uh, any any people chiming in? Uh, well, I work for a kind of technology consultancy at the moment. Um, but like eight to eight, eight years of experience on kind of you know, digital data. Good, good. Right. And Arnab? There's a few in the chat comments. Yeah. Okay, Scott's in operations, stats. Oh, okay, cool. Very interesting. Oh, you're in bioinformatics, data science too soon. Oh, good, good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Dave, insurance. Before we go, can I ask a question around um, naming inputs? I thought I saw something, something interesting here where um, I think he recommends naming by order. But then the example doesn't really replicate that. But I thought that was an interesting thing because I thought you know, Matt and you, I felt your pain at, at times because it's a lot of, a lot of inputs to kind of keep a eye on, and even just going through this example data set, and I think that's something I could really struggle with. When you, you start moving beyond the toy. Um, Was that in the book you were talking about? Yeah, I think there's a bit here. What did he say? Um, Three point two point one at the end. He just says two one. When creating an input, I recommend supplying the input ID and label arguments by position. Huh, okay. So I was just, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's that, that like, by numeric, just all of them. Yeah, that you'll, it's... You'll find very, very few examples where they'll actually specify your input ID and your label. It generally is... You know, it's kind of like dplyr where everyone just kind of has accepted that your first argument is going to be the data from the prior pipe um basically your first argument is always going to be what the what the variables can be named once you pick it up um in out in the on the server side and the second is always going to be your the label which is associated with it uh, um right I think I've misunderstood that then. So he's talking about within the function, so within the input function, you just... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking more across multiple input functions. You know, you might label them one, two, three, four. Um, anyway, okay. Yeah. Here, I can't actually show you the output of what this looks like, but... Because that may get me into trouble with work. But so, I mean, this is just an, an app, but uh, so even something like a checkbox panel or checks uh, going places. So a checkbox input panel, um, you know, you just specify what you're going to pick it up as and then and then what what it's being shown as. Um, because in the server associated with that, it's going to it's 19. You're just going to pick it up off of, you know, input dollar sign only current. Um, just so you can be sh uh, wrong one. Just so you can be sure what you're what you're picking up. I mean, we'll get into like render UIs later on, but those are basically um, that you can 
create things in your in your server that would normally be created in your uh, that would normally be created in your UI. Um, so say you have a second UI input, say you have a second um, UI side input that you want to be able to only have the options based on a prior value. Um, you would then read that in and, and apply it. Um, so there were oddly complex things. Yeah, great. Thanks, Robert. You can use those sort of conditional UI elements as well, can't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I can show that again. The conditional UI, it, it takes some getting used to um, because the way that it actually has to be specified is based on um, it's based on the JavaScript uh, on what the JavaScript output would look like. So instead of being like input dollar sign, it has to be input dot. Um, and there's something in particular that that they didn't like. Um, I mean, it, it took me a while to to get to the point that I remembered that. Uh, that or required two pi uh, two up and downs. Um, it it's useful um, the conditional panel just because you know there are times where you're not going to want it. Um, however, one thing with it, you generally want to specify uh, what the What the value is going to be if uh, if the conditional panel doesn't come up because otherwise the server tends to get angry that it can't find anything for that value. But something like here, your select eyes input. Um, I haven't actually told it. So as you can see, like selected is equal to all. So it's actually saying which one you want to select because if you don't actually give it a selected value, it's always going to choose the first one. So if, if for a select input, um, you give A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it's always going to first select A. That's just one of the odd things that it does. Um, I ought to say um, that uh, the we're we're coming up to the end of the uh, the allotted time for for the uh, the Zoom meeting. Um, so thanks everyone for 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 coming along and 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 watching the talk, and, and especially thanks to to Matt for um, putting his um, uh, slides together for us. Um, next week we're doing chapter four, which is on um, the uh, reactivity um, in Shiny and. I believe Priyanka's doing that talk. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to attend as well next week. Um, yes, thanks everyone. Um, anyway, if you'd like to carry on chatting in the the Slack group or or anything, that'd be that'd be a good place to move the conversation now because the meeting's coming to an end. Thanks, Ross. Goodbye, all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.